It's all about the human struggle to raise the level of living. That's what it's all about. I'm glad you're a part of this one. I'm Magnus Packle, and this is Magnus Packle GVA. I've always had a passion for the economic development of our society, and a desire to have a platform to express and share this passion. My belief is that we can free all of our people from the bondage of poverty and deprivation. That we can create well-paying jobs for our young people and be able to take care of our older people. That we can build a society of rising productivity, output, and income, and be competitive in the global marketplace. I have carried this passion through the years as I worked as an economist in one of the biggest private sector companies in the world, taught economics as a professor, and served in government as an advisor on economic policy and related issues. I thank God Almighty that he has allowed me to be able to do this. Now the time has come. In Magnus Packer GVA, our mission is to explore global views and ideas on how we can all contribute to a faster pace of high quality economic growth and development in Africa. Our show will appeal to people in all walks of life as it is not only analytical, but also motivating. Now let's get started. There is no doubt about the very rapid economic ascendancy of China. My calculations show that the Chinese economy will surpass the US in size by 2020. This is extraordinary, considering that just 10 years ago, the size of the Chinese economy was less than 15% of that of the United States. With this growing stature, China's influence is rising around the world, and particularly in Africa. At its recent meeting in Addis Ababa, the African Union unveiled its latest gift from China, the AU Conference Center and Office Towers, worth about $200 million. I applaud China for this, but does this mean that Africa should begin to look east and turn its back on the west? I don't think so. The West, and particularly the United States, have a lot to offer Africa in history, culture, and trade. Africa can more competitively export low-skilled goods to the United States than to China. Bottom line, both China and the West are important to Africa, and Africa must leverage the opportunities of the moment. This subject is deep, and the consequences for Africa are profound. Be sure to be with us soon when we discuss China and Africa in detail. In view today, the unrighteous economy. Connected to this, I had a discussion with Professor Dumas of the University of Texas at Dallas. But before that, our hidden economics for you. I think that just about everything that people do is driven by some economic rationale. Why do certain things happen to certain people? Every week we will try to explain the rationale behind some of these things in our segment called Hidden Economics for You. So this week, no matter who you are, if you get into poverty and stay in it for three years, you may never get out of it again. Wow. If you have just fallen into poverty, you better start looking for how to get yourself out quickly. Otherwise, as time goes by, the cost keeps on rising until it becomes impossible for you. In the first year, the cost of search for a job and getting out of poverty, both psychic and substantive, may not be quite that high, as you may be fairly confident that there are opportunities that are close by. In addition, you may have some savings to leverage. People may also be there to encourage you and associate with you. By the second year, your costs rise as you would have already tried what people sometimes call the low-hanging fruits. You must now look further, making things more expensive for you. Your psychic and substantive costs rise. Your confidence starts to wane. 
Your attitude may even change so much it repels potential helpers as you get desperate and suspicious and even angry with the world. At this point, you should start to lose your friends and sources of strength and support. By the third year, you would have completely lost all your sources of encouragement and support. The cost of search for jobs and other opportunity is now prohibitive and impossible. Everybody you knew would have been pressed. Some friends now actually avoid you. No one has hope in you any longer. What's worse, it all becomes too much for even you. You lose hope yourself and you have no money. Poverty is now your way of life. There is no way out. Folks, you fall into poverty, don't let the third year catch you there. I make the point that an unrighteous economy exists, always and everywhere, when by whatever reason, there is a significant and persistent repression of the economic participation of the people, leading to loss of hope and opportunity. The word itself unrighteous suggests that which is unjust, wicked, unfair, and unmerited. An unrighteous economy therefore implies that injustice, wickedness, unfairness, and lack of merit is used in the system to allocate scarce resources for the production of goods and services. Basically, this means that whenever this is happening, competent people are likely being excluded in the production of goods and services. And also, resources are poorly allocated. The outcome? Low productivity, low output, and a stagnant or declining level of living, leading to hopelessness and unhealthy rivalry. The primary manifestations of an unrighteous economy include excessive corruption, cronyism, rising unemployment, and poverty, and a decline in labor force participation. People not in the labor force where they are either employed or looking for work can indeed become free radicals, looking for something important to destroy. As I often put it, if a person is properly employed, the lunch hour would not be long enough to go out to bomb one or two buildings or kidnap anyone. Other manifestations of an unrighteous economy are seen all across Africa. Poor electoral processes, continued incompetent delivery of public goods and services, and increasing breakdown in law and order. When people feel excluded, they panic, become impatient, and look to beat the system. Key point. An unrighteous economy makes outcomes unpredictable and insecurity very possible. How indeed is participation repressed? Broadly speaking, economic participation can be repressed because people don't have tools to work with or because the political and economic environment is unjust, harsh, or biased. People who lack a good education or appropriate human capital development will not be able to participate optimally in the economy. Similarly, when the political economy has failed in the way it defines property rights,